So we have a lot of ways to do that, to serialize data from a map in Go to a sequence of bytes and back. Uh, and we are going to talk uh, a bit about how to select a serialization format. Byte serialization format can be JSON, can be protocol buffers, can be XML, can be SQL, can be YAML or TOML or um, Apache Arrow or a message pack or Bison or th there are so many serialization formats out there. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit here about how do you pick a serialization format. A lot of cases you get to a project and it, it's already set for you, but if you have a saying at the beginning of a project, um, these are the things you need to consider. Okay, so the first thing is the maturity of the format, right? Now, I like this uh, equation that maturity is blood plus sweat divided by the complexity of the format. And I like to go with old and boring technologies. They have been around, they've been debugged, people found the bugs for me, uh, people are using it, there is knowledge around them, there is tooling around them. So if you pick something which is old and stable, uh, usually uh, it's a safe bet. And there are so many uh, serialization formats to pick from that are, have been around that uh, if there's something new and shiny, uh, beware. Like you need to have a really good reason for picking it uh, other than uh, something which is uh, stable. Uh, another thing about old formats is something known as the Lindy effect. So the Lindy effect basically states that uh, the chances of technology staying around is proportional to how old it is by now, right? So unlike people, uh, when technology ages, if it passes uh, some amount of time, it will, the chances of it staying around for more time is even bigger. Um, it seems like counterintuitive, but there's a lot of examples. Uh, take example, cooking with fire, right? It's been around for a lot of time and we still do it today, right? Uh, so uh, microwave, I'm not sure if they'll stay a long time, but uh, cooking with fire is still still around. So um, technologies go for the old and boring ones. Uh, another criterion that you might think about is what languages support this format. If you're writing a Go only uh, system, which all the services and everything is written in Go, uh, then you're good, right? If Go supports it, then it's fine. But a lot of time, this is not the case. And the most common case is that we send data to the browser and the browser usually has JavaScript. So we want at least JavaScript to support that format. Um, but a lot of times also in to today's microservice oriented architectures, we have one service written in Go, another one in Python, another one in, um, in Java, and we would like them to talk among themselves. So we need one civilization format that all of them support, right? And uh, we see every language usually has one civilization format, which is specific to the language which is uh, the language only. And then uh, you can use it in, if you're using two services from Go, but you can share it with, with other languages. And by far, this is one of the reasons people use JSON because I think JSON is the most adopted format uh, there is. And it's supported natively by JavaScript, so um, it is really appealing. Uh, another thing we need to think about is wh what are the types that you want the serialization format to support? Uh, if you're just talking about numbers and strings, most serialization formats support that. But let's take a look uh, at three examples. Uh, the top example, uh, we have a complex numbers in Go. <clears throat> I don't know if you're aware of that, but there are complex numbers. Complex numbers are uh, have imaginary part and a real part. And they are used a lot in um, in signal processing. So when you do Fourier transformation and other things, uh, usually uh, work with uh, complex types. Uh, so almost every language has complex types, though most engineers never touch them. Um, and JSON, when you try to marshal a complex, it doesn't know that. So the JSON format, the only kind of numbers it support is floating point numbers, and that's it. So you cannot uh, natively uh, convert uh, a complex number to JSON. The second thing that is um, missing uh, from JSON is a timestamp or a daytime format. Or in Go, it's time.time. .time. So when you take time.time .time and you try to marshal it to JSON, it is going to work and we're going to see why it's working, even though JSON does not have um, 
uh, time or timestamp or daytime or whatever you want uh, type, but it is being serialized as a string. And when you serialize it back, you need to know that it's a time somehow externally, otherwise you'll get back a string. And the last thing is what I said about um, uh, JSON, it has only floating point numbers. So if you're going to take a number like N, marshal it to JSON, and then unmarshal it to uh, out, which is an empty interface, right? Out is here. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, then it's, you're going to get back a float 64. And this can be confusing. And at some cases, this is going to create some bugs in your application. So uh, the JSON uh, deserializer, when we talk about, when you serialize to a struct and it knows that the struct field is an integer, will do the right thing for you. But natively, if you don't give the JSON uh, decoder some kind of help, every number it will get, you will get back a float. So these are the types and some formats support more types, some formats support uh, less types. Some, some of them have what is known as extension types. So you can define your own types uh, to add them to the serialization form. Another thing that when we talk about types is, uh, do we have a schema for that message or not? So if you look at uh, JSON, which is very popular, JSON does not have a schema, right? You can send a JSON message. It can be a single number. It can be a list. It can be a map with all kinds of fields and all kinds of values. Uh, we really don't know. If you look, for example, on uh, SQL, SQL says, no, every column in the table must have a specific type. And when you give me something, you need to do. So uh, this is, for example, a weather uh, data that I got from uh, the American uh, Weather uh, National Weather uh, Service called NOAA. Um, and this is what you get, or a part of what you get. You get uh, five columns, uh, date, snow, Tmax, Tmin, and PGTM. Right, uh, so the date we can figure out, right? It's probably a date. The snow, the Tmax, and the Tmin, and the PGTM looks like integers, right? So this is the schema. And usually the schema only talks about the type. So it should be an integer, it should be a string, it should be um, a floating point number, etc., etc. However, uh, this is not always enough. For example, if you look at the range of temperatures, ca can you guess what, what is the unit? Right, so it doesn't look like Fahrenheit, it doesn't look like Celsius, and it for sure doesn't look like Kelvin. Yeah. So uh, we, we really don't know. Um, what they give here is one-tenth of Celsius, right? So uh, the first row is, there was between 10 degrees Celsius, the maximum and close to zero at the minimum. Um, and this is how it's, it's done. Um, And then a PGTM, when you read the documentation, it's actually actually not an integer. It's peak gust time. So this is the time when the wind was um, the strongest. Uh, without a schema, it's really hard to understand what's going on. So you need to have a schema. And the schema is always going to be there. Either it's going to be supported in the format in some way, or you're going to support it in your code. But the schema is going to be there and it should be explicit and it should be documented, and people should know about that. Um, my, my job as consult in consulting is usually on um, the border between people doing research and, and data science and the engineering system and, and the data they need. So I'm, on one hand, I'm bringing the data. So I spend a lot of time going uh, to companies and going around their data, trying to make sense of it. And, Companies, after a while, they lose track of what's going on in data. Um, you ask them about what is this column in the database, they have no idea. There's no documentation. They have no idea how it's populated. Um, and I, I, went, I was at a company, uh, we were doing a project and I told them, you know, there, there's a two week period when you don't have data that you can, uh, it was an advertising company, you can charge the publishers because you don't, there's a crucial piece of information missing from this data. And they said, no way. And I said, look, this is the data. Show me where it is. They couldn't explain it. 
and they couldn't explain it and they couldn't they didn't have any alarms or something saying you know <laughs> we're not charging enough so uh, keeping a schema of things and making sure it's very uh, interesting and get to be tricky there's some interesting languages like Q that are um, might help you with that but keep an eye on schema uh, being without schema in JSON helps you move faster because you can change a lot of things but you can also break them easier uh, so there are pluses and minuses for that as well. I tend to go with scheme formats that do have scheme. Uh, another thing that you think about is uh, performance. And what I have to say about performance is that uh, our industry has an unhealthy obsession with performance. Uh, so you need to know before you're going, uh, what are the performance requirements? So if they tell you, look, we need to answer every request in 10 milliseconds, and you measure that um, serialization of a, of a message is, let's say 500 microseconds, that's fine. You, you don't need to care that much if it's JSON or not JSON. So in most cases, the performance of the serialization is not the problem. It will be the network, it will be algorithms, it will be a lot of other things. Uh, though rarely the case uh, where I needed to find a really performance serialization format. I consulted with one company and they had um, the requirement there that they had uh, four, four microseconds per packet uh, in Go. And, and they hit, it, hit this goal, but then they need to pick the serialization format really, really uh, carefully. Uh, another thing that you need to think about is security. And there is, no serialization format that is totally secure. Here are two examples. One is that uh, there was a bug in Java at the time that if you gave it this floating point number, Java would hang. The, it was a bug in the compiler of Java. So every time you did a, a, a string to float, uh, Java would just hang. Or uh, if you had this uh, one in, in a source program, the compiler would hang. And I worked at the at the company uh, at the time that we had the, uh, uh, Tomcat servers, uh, Java-based servers, and we start seeing that people were sending this value in one of the HTTP headers, and the servers were getting stuck one after the other. Uh, the second one is um, JPEG. So JPEG, an image format, it's another serialization format, right? You take a picture and you make it a sequence of bytes. And Microsoft at one point had a, a, a bug that if someone sent you a, a JPEG, it was enough that you open the image in your email uh, in, or, in, or in, the, in the email client, and they had remote access to your machine. Okay, so, um, and, and people will still find uh, the, these things. So you need to be aware that every serialization format has its own security problems, some of them are more. And when you look at serialization format, you need to see if they are doing things to, um, to check for security after. Are they doing fuzzing? Are they doing other things? And again, if this is a widely used format, probably people figured it out more than other places. Um, another um, criteria that you might think about is, does this format support what is known as streaming? Sometimes you need to send a lot of data and you don't want to pack all the data. Let's say I query the database, I got back a million rows, and now I need to send back to the client. So I don't want to create a list of million items and send it in one big chunk. I want to send it in, in serialized way. So one after another, after another. Uh, some formats like protocol buffers support that uh, with, the, uh, with gRPC. Some, some formats like JSON do not support that. And in JSON, you need to build a big object and send it over. And we'll talk about how you can get around that, but uh, it's not supported in the format. Okay, so, um, oh, and the last thing is, sorry, is the standard library. Okay, um, if the format is already in the standard library, it's a big win for you. Every time you add a dependency to your project, you're adding uh, a risk because there is a security risk. There is a risk that they're going to do some breaking change. Uh, there is a risk that they'll decide that they don't want to um, have this repo anymore and they'll just remove it from GitHub. Uh, and there is dependencies issues and many other things. I highly encourage you, there is a link down 
in the slides to uh, our software dependency problem. It's an article written by Ross Cox. It talks about all the issues with dependency problems. So if you can do with stuff that is in the standard library without going outside, that's, that's a big win. And that's uh, the goal mode is the, the project definition. And if you have no external dependencies, that's, that's the best in my opinion. I, I really try hard to, to have as little uh, dependencies as possible. Thank you.